Uh, this is Anthony Keoli. I'm the Regional Director for the Alaska Region TTA Center, and I'd like to welcome everybody to this Grants.gov uh, workspace um, webinar uh, hosted by the Alaska Region Training and Technical Assistance Center. We are a resource of the Administration for Native Americans, and ANA promotes uh, self-sufficiency for Native Americans by providing discretionary grant funding for community-based projects and training and technical assistance to eligible tribes and Native organizations. ANA's vision is that Native communities are thriving. So a little bit about uh, the Alaska region. We are one of the four regional training and technical assistance centers. And uh, we've been, we collaborate with all the, the different TA centers. Um, uh, myself, I'm the regional director and uh, I'm going to be doing the introduction. Um, uh, Mrs. Miss Angela Camus is going to be leading most of the presentation today. Um, she's the, our training manager, and uh, she has 20 years of experience working with a wide array of clients in training and grants management. Um, she's she's a, a real expert and uh, uh, extremely knowledgeable about a lot of the different application processes and grants management processes. Uh, within our organization, within the TTA Center. Uh, Charles Peel is our technical assistance manager, and uh, he's based in Seattle for the Alaska region. And uh, newly joining our team is Richard Perry, who is the outreach and technology specialist. A little bit about what we provide. We provide free training and technical assistance to applicants as well as our grantees. Um, we provide webinars like th this one here, um, as well as we collaborate with the other TTA centers to develop application and grants management and project management, program management um, tools, guides, and resources, uh, most of which or all of which are available on the national ANA website and the resource library. Uh, so, to start off with, uh, this webinar actually uh, was part of a request and part of a collaboration with one of our regional partnerships, uh, the Alaska Growth Capital. And uh, what we're trying to do in the Alaska region is, is we're trying to improve access to our training and technical assistance by partnering with different uh, native regional organizations um, who can provide additional expertise, resources, and access to their networks, their in-region in networks, um, to enable uh, Native organizations to access our training. Um, sometimes our regional partners uh, assist with travel scholarships to get to our free trainings. And uh, they have their own ex expertise uh, that might be in the form of financing or in-kind resources or just their specialized knowledge. So we found this to be um, a strategy for for really uh, reaching out and, and improving access to the services that we provide. Some of our partnerships have been uh, Coeric, um, the Bristol Bay Area Health Corporation that's uh, helping us with a, a training in the Bristol Bay region. And, uh, and for this webinar, uh, we're collaborating with Alaska Growth Capital. So um, we have Aurora Warrior with Alaska Growth Capital, and I asked her to give a little bit of an introduction uh, to her organization. And, and before she does that, I'm very familiar with Alaska Growth Capital. Uh, as, a, as a small business, we struggle to get access to capital ourselves. Uh, most of the standard in banking institutions uh, really wouldn't assist us, and we were very happy in years past to receive assistance from Alaska Growth Capital. Um, so, Aurora, can you give a little bit about your organization, please? Well, thank you, Anthony, for that introduction, and I warmly appreciate the partnership with you and your team members. Uh, I have had the pleasure of joining Alaska Growth Capital's team this year, but Alaska Growth Capital has been around since 1997, and 
We are a non-traditional community lender. We specialize in USDA and small business loans, and um, we are also a community development a financial institution with a special unique mission like um, your organization, Anthony, that, um, that focuses primarily on providing financial resources to Native America. Um, um, specifically, we are a subsidiary of Arctic Slope Regional Corporation, so we have a, a special emphasis for um, providing resources to the North Slope residents. And overall, Alaska Growth Capital operates in Alaska, but we also operate in uh, five other states, and we are the, the non-traditional lenders that banks oftentimes refer clients to us. And we're, we're a small team of uh, 18, but we deploy all over Alaska and uh, five additional states. Great, thank you. Um, I have an additional bio here, um, but uh, is there anything else that you might want to say about Alaska Growth Capital, Aurora? I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the stuff we're doing together. Yes. Um, well, this has been a powerful partnership with your organization. Um, in past, in the past, we've provided grants training, and upcoming in 2018, we'll also be partnering once again for another grants training and just trying to strengthen the resources provided to um, the regions of Alaska. And it's been a powerful partnership, and I really appreciate um, where your organization has um, empowered our our mission, because our missions are aligned. And then also very exciting is that um, in December 1st, Quintillion Broadband brought went live for bringing broadband to five of the communities on the North Slope, and this is some of the fastest internet of the world, and that's just at the, at the edge of the Arctic. And that, with that, allows webinars like this and also other untold possibilities, economic opportunities and educational opportunities. So uh, that's all I have to share with about Alaska Growth Capital. Thank you, Great. Anthony. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, just an example of what we're trying to do with our regional partnerships, uh, and also uh, because Aurora mentioned the recent advances in broadband, um, we are we're in the process of developing a sort of hands-on virtual training lab where uh, participants will be able to access uh, terminals in our office and literally uh, try out different applications like Grants.gov, where we can watch over the shoulder virtually. That does require better broadband, better internet, and uh, because <clears throat> because of the advances on the North Slope with the internet connectivity, uh, <clears throat> we're going to be doing some pilot tests uh, with the North Slope villages on on this hands on hands on lab, and uh, and then expanding it to other regions in the state with our partnerships. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that, and uh, as well as some of the other things we're planning, a regional project funding uh, summit and uh, your, your support of participants uh, going to our project planning and development training uh, in the spring. So I'm looking forward to all of that. Um, so really uh, what's, what, uh, what was the impetus behind this webinar is the changes that are happening with grants.gov. And um, a lot of you that have been grant writing for many years maybe remember when we, when we made the huge switch from paper applications to the grants.gov platform and that was a that was a huge shift uh, which required a pretty steep learning curve so the changes that are happening right now aren't quite as uh, dramatic as that but uh, there are some major changes happening in 2018 and uh, I know Aurora was very interested in making sure that uh, her communities on the North Slope were aware and of course we as the as the PTA Center for the state want to ensure that uh, organizations in Alaska and as well as our partnerships with the other TTA centers around the country are aware of uh, these changes that are happening. Um, so the big the big change is that the traditional, the, the so-called legacy PDF application that uh, uh, we've 
tried to get accustomed to using, <laughs> just joking, um, that we've been using is going away December 31st. And starting in 2018, there's a new platform. It's it's a web portal that's part of the whole grants.gov uh, site uh, where you're actually going to be assembling forms in your applications and creating workspaces for individual applications. And so the this is really uh, what we're going to be covering today. But also, because we have some organizations that may not even have access to grants.gov, um, Angela Camus, when she takes over, she's going to she's going to go over briefly the steps to getting registered in grants.gov, uh, which is a prerequisite to even creating a workspace. So, so why is this a concern for us? Well, just historically, when when we when the big switch was made to grants.gov years ago in 2009, a, a report was written that assessed the impact of that. And in the Alaska region, not only back in 2009 did we have very poor connectivity, but uh, digital literacy was a challenge, still remains a challenge. So with that change to the Grants.gov platform back at that time, Alaska saw a huge decline in the grant submitted. And um, we're trying to head that off with this new change. We, we really want to be proactive and uh, make sure that uh, Native communities are, are aware of these changes moving forward. And so we're, this is really just an attempt to be proactive and uh, let you all be aware of the changes, give you an introduction to what's coming, and then point you to additional resources at grants.gov um, where there's additional training and YouTube videos and so on. So at this, with this, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Angela Camus. Angela Camus, as I said, is our training manager, and uh, she's been working extremely hard to uh, put this together, and I, I want to thank her for that. So, Angela? Thank you, Anthony. Good morning, everyone. Well, afternoon for most of you. I wanted to let you know that our goal today, as Anthony mentioned, was to provide some basic principles of account creation for DUNS, SAM, and Grants.gov so that you can move forward and then look at the basic principles of the Grants.gov workspace about creating a workspace and using that space for application submission. So DUNS, for those of you who may not be familiar, is the data universal numbering system that if you're going to work with the federal government, uh, your organization needs to have a DUNS number. So that's the first place you're going to start. From there, once you have your DUNS number, you'll register with SAM, which is the System for Awards Management, and then you can establish a grants.gov account. We also wanted to make you aware that there's an entire series for uh, grants.gov videos that you can uh, introduce yourselves to. There is about six videos in this series that will help take you through, and they're very short, succinct videos. So grants.gov has actually done a really nice job on that. So again, uh, really quick, what is the DUNS number? It's a unique nine-digit identifier for each physical location of your business. It's free for every business that's going to register with the federal government for contracts or grants. And you can do this by registering online or by phone. And detailed instructions can be had on the website. When we hand out the PowerPoint after this, the web links will be live for you should you need to access them. So one of the first things you're going to do is you want to search your organization to if you are not aware of having whether you or not you have a uh, DUNS number or you are already registered with SAM. So you go to actually SAM.gov and you will search 
doing a public search for your organization, and it's just a quick search. You put in the your, the name of your organization, and uh, it'll tell you also whether or not your account is active or inactive. If it's inactive, that means that things need to be renewed. So again, first you have to start with getting a DUNS number, and this can take five to 10 business days. You'll need to provide um, a series of information, the legal name, the headquarters, your address, your phone number. Once your DUNS number comes back, then you'll want to get into the SAM system. Again, it is free and you need to register. One of the things you want to know is that your account also has to get updated once a year. And that passwords change often, somewhere between 30 and 90 days, uh, they change that. And so you need to make sure that you're constantly updating and staying updated with your passwords. What can often happen is it can take a long time to get your password reset in the event that it expires. And this has become an issue for folks because if your SAM registration is not up to date, you will not be able to apply. So to create a SAM account, you'll go in and you're going to actually create a user account. Then you'll create individual account details. So when you create the individual account, you will uh, provide the requested information. You're going to get a series of email notifications that you will click through to validate your account. You will create your username and password, and you will um, you will also use this same process if you are revalidating. Once you have created this and you get it back, then you actually go in to register your organization. So you start as an, with this individual account, work your way through, and then register your entity. Again, this can take up to two weeks, so you want to be sure that you have enough time. There is numerous information and segments, and the entire process for registration can take about 40 minutes to an hour as you walk through providing your legal business name, the type of uh, organization that you are. You'll need things like your annual revenue, who's the owner, the NICS codes that you're using, and one of the big pieces for this is that you are going to identify who is your entity's administrator, who has access to view this and update this, who's going to file reports for your organization. There are several roles that are involved. Who can manage the roles? And lastly, one, there are numbers of points of contacts. The biggest piece is who is the eBiz point of contact for your organization? This individual is the person that will be getting emails from grants.gov, and they are the person who can register your entity with grants.gov. This is not your AOR. Those are two different people. Not that you, and I'll explain a little bit more, but once you get into grants.gov, you can make this the same person, but they will have two different sign-ins. This eBiz point of contact cannot create workspace accounts, nor can the eBiz submit grants through grants.gov. Once your SAM account is up to date and valid, 
you will go in and you register with grants.gov. Every individual that is going to work with Workspace is going to register with grants.gov. Whether they are with your organization or if you're an individual grant writer, everyone registers as an individual account. You can reach this by either in the upper right hand corner through the register link or there is a selection of a drop down tab on the applicant registration and you'll add a profile. So you're once you set up your profile that you'll provide a username and password, you'll get a link and you'll register with that link. You'll have the choice of connecting yourself with an organization, skipping this, or just uh, being an individual applicant. If you're typically, if you're a grant writer outside of uh, most organizations, then you would want to select continue and skip adding a profile at this time. If you are the eBiz point of contact, then you will add your organizational application applicant profile at this time. To do that, you'll need to add, you'll need the DUNT number, the profile, your job title, and you'll click save here. So remember, there's different types of roles when this happens. The eBiz POC manages all the individuals that have registered, but they are the only one who can manage the organization's profile. However, again, the funny piece is they cannot create workspace, nor can they submit. The types of users are these three. You can register and ask to be, and the eBiz point of contact can find you and allow you to be the organization's authorized representative or the AOR. You can have a role to manage workspaces, which means you can create workspaces, you can have full access within them to fill out forms, or you can have no role. No role means that you will only be able to fill out specified forms. The AOR allows for the submission of the application. The Manage Workspace role only allows for filling out forms and, and managing within that. And then the no roles are limited to certain data sheets. Once the DUNS number, the SAM account, and the profile is set up, and, the a and at least one AOR has been assigned, you're ready to create an actual workspace in the grants.gov website. Before I go any further, uh, for those of you that have worked in grants.gov, there is still software compatibility issues that can happen. So from the Applicants tab on the grants.gov home site, you'll want to drop down and select Adobe Software Compatibility. You'll select this link and it will take you to a page that will allow you to see any compatibility issues as well as verify the compatibility of your software. There is a link that you can click and it will take you through a series of steps. So let's start with workspace. What is this workspace? 
We used to have to download a packet and fill it out and upload it for submission. As mentioned earlier, the packets are expiring at the end of this month and, a, and the workspace platform will now be the only way to apply for federal grants through grants.gov. Workspace will allow a grant team to simultaneously access and edit different forms within an application. Additionally, the forms can be filled out online or as a PDF. It will be your choice. Grants.gov Workspace also allows applicants and organizations to tailor their application workflow by deciding who can fill out what forms and who has access to what forms. The forms can be filled out by different users in the application instead of exchanging a single PDF packet via email or a flash drive. Only one form can be worked on at a time. However, multiple users can work simultaneously in the workspace on various different forms. Again, this is the workspace video series. And there is introducing workspace, user roles and access levels, how to create a workspace, how to add participants, completing forms, and how to submit a federal grant. These are broken down into smaller, uh, about three minute videos. So the first thing you wanna do is locate your application package. It is highly suggested that you actually sign in before you begin your search, as this will allow you to go right into workspaces without having an additional step in between. Um, and as I've worked it myself, I did find that it is much cleaner to log into my workspace account first. So you use your username and password, that individual one that you created, then you will go to search grants, there's a tab. I find it easiest to search by the CFDA number within the funding opportunity, or you can use the funding opportunity or various uh, keywords if you don't know exactly which application you're looking for. Once you locate the application packet that you're looking for, you will click on the link for the opportunity number. This will take you uh, to another page and you will need to, uh, that will have lots of information about the synopsis, the history, and other documents related to your funding opportunity. You'll want to select the package tab. From the package tab, you will be able to click the apply button. And this will take you to a space, a new page, and you will click the create workspace button. From here, you will want to select a new workspace. Then you will fill out an application filing name, just like you did for the packets. And remember that there are character limitations that you will want to uh, observe for the file naming conventions. It is, um, it is highly suggested not to use native language here, as this can cause a validation error with the actual submission. And lastly, you will create the Create Workspace button. And this will take you to a brand new workspace. There is a workspace progress bar across the top that will allow you that as you progress through this, the workspace bar will turn green when you're completing certain cycles. Uh, it's blue when you have not started. Red if you're in progress but not complete. And red with an X means your application was uh, rejected. Additionally, here you will find the application filing name that you created, the ID that it has, 
if your AR is active, who owns the workspace? So this is the person that actually created the workspace. Again, it does not have to be the AOR. Each time that the um, workspace is accessed, there's the opening and closing dates, the DUNS number, and the SAM expiration date for your organization. Before I move on to the rest of the workspace form, I want you to know that you can work on this, sign out, and log back in. When you log back in, you can search for the workspaces that you are currently working on by selecting, whoops, sorry, by selecting the check boxes in the workspace status of new, in progress, clicking the search button, or if you know the specific CFDA number or the funding opportunity title, clicking the search button will bring, if you select these, it will bring up all of the, app, the workspaces that you currently manage. You can find the one that you want, select it, and go back into that workspace to continue working. There are four tabs within this, the Forms, Participant, Activity, and Details tab. When you click on the Forms tab, this shows you all of the mandatory and optional forms for this particular application packet. You can, and then it will also show you the name of the form, whether it's mandatory, the status of your form, the last time it was worked on, whether or not uh, someone has locked the form because they are looking for, looking, working on it, excuse me. And then the action buttons. Again, as I had mentioned a little bit before, you can download and then re-upload, fill out a form and re-upload it. You can reuse a form that you've already used, or you can select using a web form. The next tab is the participants tab. This tells you everyone that you have provided access to and the type of access that they have for this particular workspace. The activity tab shows everyone who has worked on the, for on the various forms, who it was, when they worked on it. It's a timestamp. And then the details tab lists um, a submission history, including links to download uh, anything that you've submitted and potentially resubmit. So I've talked about adding participants to a workspace. This can happen in two ways. You can click the Add from Workspace Organization button to search for a user within your organization. And there are several types, several ways to do this search. You can um, search all active people that have the AOR role, a managed workspace role, or just active applicants. You'll enter their first and last name, hit search, find them, and add them. Or, especially if they are from outside your organization, you will need to, you, to know their username. You'll enter their username here and click search, and then you'll be able to add them. You can also uh, use this for, um, on the links, you can remove participants if they're, if they're no longer working with your organization, uh, you can reassign ownership. 
And this is all done by the Easy Biz POC, that point of contact. Filling out forms can be done in several ways. Each application has its own set of individual, mandatory, and optional forms to fill out and submit. You open and complete all of the documents here by clicking on the link. And you will either, you will decide whether or not you're going to use the web form, download, and re-upload or reuse another form. If you use the um, download PDF form and re-upload it, it will update the web form. What, and one thing to note here is that while you are working within Workspace and you're working through the web form, it does uh, save in the background automatically every five minutes, although it is still suggested that you save regularly so that you don't lose your work. It doesn't matter what order you fill out the forms in, as they will just appear in the packet in a predetermined order. And when you open the web forms, which is this, any mandatory field will have an, a red asterisk. You can navigate by tabbing through the fields and you can click the selections. At the bottom of uh, the scrolled page, you will see the save, check for errors, and close button. So if you are filling this out, you get an interruption with phone call, quickly click save, you won't lose your work, and you can come right back. There is a timeout feature with uh, Workspace as well. There are several types of fields within the web forms. There is an open entry text where you will type in the actual information, for example, names and addresses. There are various drop down menus, and there are also calendar and date options. There are radio buttons to click. And there is also an ability to attach files through online forms. In the web forms, if you hover over an area, you can get a description of the field. And if you miss a mandatory field, the red will come up and it will tell you what the errors are and how, what you need to do to fill out that particular field. The Save button actually stores and finalizes your information. The Check for Errors, Check for Validation. Uh, in the packet form, you had to wait until submission to find out if you had errors through emails. In the workspace, as you complete each form, you get a validation of whether or not the form has been completed appropriately and has passed. And then close exits the online form itself. If you download the PDF form, you will be able to fill in the form, check for errors, save and print the application form. And just as before, the mandatory fields are gold with a red outline. And if you hover over the form fields, again, these will also provide help assistance and there are error messages that explain what you have missed. After you close the document, when you go back to the workspace platform, the status for the actual forms will change. 
when you are looking to finalize your application at the end, just before submission, you're going to want to look to see if all of the forms, A, have passed, but also B, is there any forms that are showing that they are locked? It is highly suggested that you unlock these forms before you contact the authorized representative to sign and submit the application packet. The AOR can bypass these locked forms. However, if someone actually is not done completing the form, which is why they have locked the form, this could cause an incomplete form to be submitted. So once you are finished with a form, you want to make sure that it is passed, but you want to unlock the form for the AOR. They will look to see if there is any errors and check then once that happens, a sign and submit button will be activated. Until all the forms have passed, this sign and submit button will be grayed out. Only the works, only workspace participants that are the AORs will actually be able to sign in and submit the application. They will click this sign in submit button. The, they will once again check on the passed or locked. Again, they can hit that continue button and they will um, submit. It will ask for their password. They will enter that and then select sign and submit. Once the application has been submitted for the, uh, into the system for the funder, you will be able to check your application status. The application status can be checked in uh, three different manners. You can, when you are logged in, you can select the applicants tab select check application status, and the status of the application will show up. You can, from the applications tab when you are logged in, click on the uh, applicant center and track my application. If you are not logged in along the left-hand side of the home page, there is still a check the application status button. A drop down menu will enter. You'll put in your tracking number and you can, uh, just as before, you can enter multiple tracking numbers and all of your information will come up, whether um, it's completed, received. All of these, um, Official emails will be sent for the application packet itself will be sent to your authorized representative. So you want to make sure that they have been fully aware that submission has occurred. While we're not supposed to sign in using someone else's username and password, it does happen. So um, make sure that the authorized representative, if they're out, someone has the ability to check their emails just in case something has been rejected. At this time, we're gonna open it up to a few questions. However, I do want to let you know that the Grants.gov Help Desk is the best source of this information. I have found them to be very helpful with the uh, application packets. They are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and uh, except for the federal holidays. You can reach them through their website, an email, or their toll-free number. And I want to thank all of you for participating today. 
I wanted to give it a minute for questions. And while we're doing that, um, and, uh, a link for the evaluation for today's webinar will also go into the chat box. And it will also get emailed out to each of you. We want to hear your comments. I feel like Jeopardy. Do, 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 do. You can type your questions in the question and answer box. Well, I wanted to thank you all for participating. Thank you, Robin. You can find each of our contact information here on the screen, as well as the contact information for the other TTA centers. If there's no questions, I will turn this back over to Anthony. Uh, I see one question uh, wondering if the new ANA announcements are out yet. No, uh, on grants.gov, the forecast uh, is that they will be out January 5th. That is the best information I have at the moment is what uh, ANA has posted on the forecast. I see another question, can the AOR unlock the forms? When they go to submit, they, there is a, a button that will tell them that the forms are locked, and they have the option to click a button that says continue. This unlocks the forms automatically and then submits them. Again, though, if they are locked, there is a chance that they may not be complete. Give another minute or two here if there's more questions. Uh, another question. The first ANA deadline is January 8th. Do you think that may move given the announcements won't be out till the 5th? Um, I am not sure. I never heard a January 8th deadline. Uh, on the forecast, it shows that once the uh, announcements come out, there will be, uh, they're forecasting a 60-day uh, submission time. Are you able to recall a submission? and make changes and resubmit? I believe the answer to that question is yes. Um, and that comes through on that details page. There's um, a button will appear once you have actually submitted. Can multiple users view the same form at the same time in different locations? The answer to that question is no. Only one person at a time can actually be in a form. I question whether agencies include all mandatory forms at grants.gov. USDA is um, 
problematic. So right now, not all of the forms are um, able to use web form, the web, have the web form option, and the workspace. As you get into register, you will notice uh, whether or not they have the the web form opportunity or if it's still just a packet, especially until uh, the end of the month. And if the particular agency that you're working for does not have all their forms there, typically they will generally have them on their website. Is there only one workspace per applicant? No, it's only one workspace per application, and then several, um, but each organization can have several um, different workspaces for the various applications. I believe that's what you mean, Mr. Charles. You're welcome. Okay. I think that's about it. I think so. Okay. Um, so I think we're going to wrap this up. I uh, appreciate uh, everybody's attendance today. I know for some people it's after five on the East Coast. Um, so uh, again, thank you, Angela, for putting this all together and keeping abreast of the changes and working with grants.gov to get the latest information. Um, like Angela said, the grants.gov is really uh, the ideal source uh, for the latest information. They're updating it continuously. And uh, we uh, we look forward to working with everybody during the upcoming application season. Um, and I think with that, uh, I'll just say, Guayana, uh, thank you for participating. So take care. <laughs>